Welcome to Call of the Friend. We've spent a lot of time getting to this point, <laughs> but this is what it's all about. Our previous videos in the Skillful Living series have just been context setting, just creating the background for this video. This is the most important one so far. So let's go through the background one more time just to set the context. First was the foundation series, and that reveals the Buddha's teaching of dependent origination, the process of becoming. This is the background science or the technology of becoming that we use in all our work. This is the most important thing because it teaches you how to become anything that you want to be. Mastery of becoming is required for all the teachings in our series. So if you haven't watched this video series, go back and check it now. All the links on the left side are live. You can click them and go right to the playlists. The next series. Becoming Genius gives an account of our system of learning, self-teaching, where you can learn anything that you want, any skill to a professional degree of proficiency. And this is very important because what we're teaching here is extremely subtle, very difficult for most people, especially Westerners, because it deals with ontological concepts that are not covered, not presented in normal Western education. Only if you get to graduate or even postgraduate levels of study will you even encounter these ideas. But this is the basis of our teaching and the work that we do on the Buddha's teaching. We gave an extended example of ontological analysis in our series, Being in the World. Being in the world describes basic human life, the human condition, what it is to be in this world. And if you got it, if you had the right context coming into that series and you understood the terminology that we use, at the moment you should be very concerned. Right? Oh my God, what have I got myself into? Human life on planet Earth, being in the world, is a trap where we are forced to give up who we really are and reflect some external system of values designed to turn us into a slave, a passive being, someone who can be manipulated, someone who can be shaped by external factors. In other words, we give up our freedom for the convenience of simply going along with the crowd. And in that way we lose our selfhood. We lose our individuality. We become a pawn in someone else's game. To realize this is very uncomfortable, but it's a stage that we must go through to be prepared for the most important part, which is the call of the friend. What is the call of the friend? It's an opportunity to achieve authenticity, to come to our real individuality and reclaim our eternal identity. And what is that? Well, you're just going to have to find out for yourself. It can't be expressed in words. We can talk about it. We can say, oh, you're a space where the universe shows up. But that doesn't really tell you very much, and it doesn't give you a basis for action. But the call of the friend is the moment when the tension between the real self, the authentic being, and the false self caused by being in the world begins to resolve. So this is where the relief begins. This is where the cessation of suffering begins when we hear and respond to the call 
of the friend. The call of the friend can happen to everyone. It is a potential that can occur at any moment due to the inherent tension of being in the world. The call of the friend leads us out of this tension towards a resolution based on achieving our authentic individuality. Everyone thinks that they are an authentic individual. But if you have understood the message of being in the world, it is that we're not. We have the illusion of choice. We have a simulation of freedom. But the boundaries and conditions of those choices and freedom are set by someone else. This is the message of being in the world. They are set by forces beyond our control. So what is within our control is the way we look at things and the choices we make based on our real opportunities, our real possibilities. And the problem is we have lost the means of recognizing those possibilities for what they are. The call of the friend can be heard from within ourselves. It can also be echoed by someone outside of us, someone who is further along in the process of regaining their authentic being. This is a special kind of friendship, not based on attachment or seeking reward, but on regaining and maintaining one's individual integrity, wholeness. Now, there are two definitions of integrity. The original definition is to be whole, to be fully functional, to be a complete human being with every part in working order. Unfortunately, the second definition of integrity, which is to be moral and follow some system of morality outside of ourselves, has become the accepted default definition in today's world. This only started to happen about 20, 25 years ago. Up until then, all dictionaries defined integrity as wholeness, completeness. But now uh, some interested parties are furthering an agenda that wants us to look at integrity as following their system of morality. In other words, accepting control again. The thing is, a person who has integrity is automatically moral. A person who has integrity automatically follows their conscience. And we'll be getting into that in this series very deeply. When we hear the call of the friend within us, we seek external confirmation of its silent message. If we are fortunate, there is someone near us who can echo that call, summoning us to the court of conscience in the hall of silence within our hearts. This opens up the possibility for actualizing authentic being. So this is something that has to happen to everyone. Sometimes it's called the dark night of the soul, although that's really an expression of a value system that we don't subscribe to. It is dark and it is silent, but the hall of truth of the court of conscience within the heart is a place we all have access to. And in fact, we go there every night in dreamless sleep, but we don't remember. The point of this series is to enter this place consciously, deliberately, and confront the silence, confront the emptiness and the darkness, confront death. In the court of conscience, we are the accused. Our friend is our advocate. Authentic being is the judge. And death is the bailiff. If you went through being in the world, you know that our attitude toward death and our realization of nothingness, emptiness, non-being, is the most important factor in attaining authentic individuality. Why is this? Because real being can only be known in the context of non-being, non-existence, or death. 
This is as much a scientific fact as that things fall down, <laughs> or that light travels at the speed of C, 186,000 miles per second. It's simply a fact. If we try to define ourselves and understand the meaning of our existence in terms of something outside ourselves, which is not really ours, then the meaning of our life becomes distorted. It becomes subject to the whims of something we don't choose, of something that is made to control us. Whereas death is our own most possibility. After all, no one can die for us. Only we can die for ourselves. And when we do, that's the moment when we find out the real meaning of our life. The court of conscience accuses us of being inauthentic, destroying the unrealized possibilities of authentic being and action within us, and the irresponsibility of making the other the cause of our actions. And as soon as we open our mouth in self-defense, Your Honor, I... We declare our guilt. What can we do but confess and take refuge of the mercy of the court? In other words, our own conscience speaks to us and says, You're being a phony. You're not being real. You're not being who you really are inside. Your identity, your being is simply a reflection of something external, something not yours. So you're a thief, you're a rascal, you're a liar. That's what inauthentic means. More than that, we have failed to choose the possibilities that are most our own, and instead chosen some other possibilities from some outside source. This is because we have lost the ability to recognize those possibilities that no one else can imitate, that are exactly our own. And finally, we have also lied in making outside forces the cause of our actions. Oh, I did it because they made me. Oh, I felt that way because they did it to me. No. We are all responsible for our condition. We cause our condition by our previous activities in life. This is called karma. Everyone is performing actions and everyone is experiencing the result. So whatever happens to us, however we feel, whatever conditions that we find ourselves in, thrown by life into a certain situation is because we created the causes of that situation in a previous life or in the past in this life. This is karma. And there's no escape from it. Both the good karma and the bad karma that we have created is going to affect us and we're going to experience the result. We have to learn to take responsibility for this. And say, no, no, they didn't do it to me. I did it to myself. And then to undo the causes of that karma. This is, of course, a lifetime piece of work. But what else is there to do if we are to be who we really are? Our only hope is the promise of our advocate, the friend, that, Your Honor, the defendant will engage himself in a remedial program to recognize his mistakes and revive his authentic being. I will see that he enrolls in the school of being integrity. The judge will silently approve and close the proceeding, warning that it can be reopened at any time. Death can come at any moment. No one can prevent it. It's going to happen. So our only respite from the jaws of death is engaging in a program to correct our mistakes and actualize our authentic being. That is the only response that will satisfy our conscience. 
And it is our conscience that punishes us. It judges us. And it also sets the sentence. Our own self. There's no need for a God or some uh, heaven and hell. Heaven and hell are within us. Heaven and hell are determined by our own conscience. And death is the bailiff. Death is the force behind the court of conscience. That death can come at any moment, cut our life short from what we plan, and make us, force us to accept whatever meaning we have created with our actions. This is what drives us. This is what creates the urgency for appearing before our conscience and resolving the tension between inauthentic and authentic being. Our guilty plea and our commitment to regenerate our authentic being is the bail bond that earns us temporary respite from death, the bailiff of the court of conscience. Our release is conditional contingent upon our keeping our promise and actually doing the work advised by the friend, knowing that the world will fight and try to deceive us at every turn, we still must keep our word as promised by our advocate. This is the measure of our integrity, the price of real and lasting freedom and dignity. So the friend within is the voice of our conscience calling us to the court in the hall of silence where death will ensure that we are brought to judgment before our own self. The advocate is the friend, the voice of conscience, whether internal or external. As it so happens, once we hear the call internally, one goes in search of an echo of that voice in the world outside. And if he is fortunate, he comes to meet a person who embodies that voice, the voice of the friend. And if he's intelligent, he takes the advice given by the friend and uses it to redeem himself in the eyes of his own conscience. This is the path. This is the route to freedom. This is sadhana. This is work on oneself. This is what we have to do to overcome the guilt that we feel for giving up our true nature and becoming something inauthentic, phony. So this is the challenge of the friend of the heart. Come to know yourself Come to see who you really are in the dark light of death. Let death, your own most possibility of non-existence, show you the way to real, authentic being. That is the essence of the call of the friend.